Welcome to Quest, a program sponsored by the First Existentialist Church of Atlanta. Today, we're going to talk with the minister of that church, Reverend Lanier Clance, the minister and the founder of the First Existentialist Church, founded in 1976. I want to just ask Reverend Clance, what prompted him to even consider the task of beginning a congregation of your own? Now that's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good. That's a real good question. Um, I believe what, over the years I've had lots of different experiences with different religious communities and some that I actually worked in and others just a fascination with with um, religious history in this country, denominational history, and then just generally just religious history among human beings. And I felt that there was something that was um, lacking in, for me, in existing uh, congregations, and I wondered if, if certain elements were put together, if there would be other people that would find that um, worth their time and, and want to be a part of it. You said that you felt like there were some elements missing mm -hmm. for you. Right. What, was, what are some of those elements? Um, one is, one of the elements was, it's hard not to use cliches or jargon word, but yeah. uh, it seems to me that at its best, religion has captured what is whenever people were expressing it. Like, if I go back to more ancient religions like the Roman, the Roman and Greek religions, that they tried to capture the, the anxiety and the despair and all around the changing of the seasons. So you get a lot of nature um, worship and a, and a lot of close connections with the seasons and all. It seemed to me that, that we're in the time we're in, that there's certain things that we um, have around us and the elements of where existentialism comes in. There's a lot of loneliness in existence that's not acknowledged. Even among people who are very healthy and have lots of things, there's some moments of loneliness. There's some anxieties about that no longer um, we live in a world that we've gotten aware that we haven't been able to get all organized. Like someone may work for a company for 20 years and be a good employee and suddenly nothing beyond their control the company goes out of business or is merged the, the concept of stability that was created a little bit in the early part of this, this century I think many of us in our generation have seen kind of dissolve and some that came after us have not even seen it so that a religious com a community says look it's hard uh-huh uh, uh-huh he said the despair and the anguish in the old religions, Greek and Egyptian, mm -hmm. that's certainly part of the existential philosophy dealing with. How do you see in the uh, church, the existentialist congregation now, that despair and anxiety are addressed? Largely just by admitting it exists or like we have special programs and one that comes to mind is a recent Father's Day where there's lots of the different people have different feelings about their fathers and some they've died and it'd be all right to mourn more than three days after the funeral uh -huh. to appreciate that grieving might go on for years if there's a close relationship uh -huh. and we have I think there's been a tendency to hurry up and get over things hurry up and get over grief hurry up and get over your failures hurry up and move on there's almost a, a taboo in our society is from admitting anything admitting, negative yeah. and that this may be a part of your life for a long time grieving may go on for some people for all their life a lot of uh, criticism is leveled at the existentialists for being so pessimistic do you find in the existentialist congregation is it loaded with pessimism no, what I find, and I believe this, there's also a concept present in existentialism that talks about paradoxes. And this is a paradox which I have tried to find different ways to explain it. 
If I allow myself to grieve, for instance, really grieve, and be and acknowledge that, then the possibilities of celebrating and feeling a little joy increase tremendously. If I allow myself to feel alone and say I am alone, what often happens, ironically, just almost immediate, if I spend time with that, that then I suddenly feel a connection with someone. Okay, so that you know really I can strive to get that connection. If I never validate my aloneness and that I am responsible and alone, I may not get it. So there's that paradox that the other part of the congregation is a lot of joy and excitement, which can be seen on the services that are on Thursday evening, six to seven on this channel. There's a lot of joy and excitement that even that comes through the the video process. So you're saying then that if you allow yourself to acknowledge the pain in existence, mm -hmm. that then the joy is more present? It's possible. And there's something just relieving about not holding and it's like a double, it's a double bind or double uh, being under a, like a double curse. At first you got the sadness and then if I'm sitting on what I'm not supposed to let anybody know I have it because this happened five years ago, then I really, that takes a lot of energy, takes a lot of conscious thought, not to accidentally smile too much. Um, it takes a lot to walk around with not only the initial experience, but then protecting yourself from letting anybody see that you're still reeling from it or whatever. Well, does the existentialist congregation, you say that uh, on, there is a program now where you're broadcasting, yeah, right. Do these qualities of uh, the human emotions yeah, that you're talking about, they do. do they come yeah. through on those yeah, programs? So. Let me ask you something about uh, responsibility. You said, uh, as an existentialist, taking responsibility mm -hmm. for yeah. what happens in your life. How, how do you see your taking responsibility for your own religious needs affecting the creation of this church. Okay, first of all, what I'd like to say, and I'd like to get real clear, because there's lots of people running around blaming the victim, so to speak. Okay. I don't think I'm responsible for what happens to me. Okay. Uh, recently, a rabbi wrote a real fine book, and I wish I knew his name was Bad Things Happening to Good People. Mm -hmm. I'm aware that I, lots of things happen that I don't choose to happen. What I do believe is I can choose how I'm going to respond to those things that happen. Now, is, am I being yes. clear on that? That, uh -huh. that like my car may blow up and I can decide whether I'm going to get another one, I'm going to cry, I'm going to sue, I'm going to, I'm going to put, I mean, there, but I don't believe I choose, because there are individuals in this society that go around saying that, which I find terrifying because people are already suffering and saying, well, why did you choose this suffering? Okay, okay and that's why I want to get real so clear. So there are about, limits well, to I, the responsibility. Well, anything can to us. I mean, a, you know, a meteorite could fall through the house or something. Mm -hmm. And to say, well, I sat here and chose that, I think that's just hogwash. Okay. What, after a meteorite falls through the house, then what am I going to do? That's something different. You know, and that's... And I believe for me what this has to do with the church is I felt certain spiritual, uh, ethical needs. I wanted to be in a community where I did not feel strange. Strange? Yeah, and estranged. You could and say. estranged, okay. And alienated and all those words they used back in the 50s, a lot of people. And the, what I did was then I responded by trying to create, you know, gathering and people together and keep exploring if that's possible. To allow something to develop? Yeah, and to put in there. I mean, you know, I could, yeah, I could sit in a room all my life and say, I wish this would happen. Mm -hmm. And it's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. I mean, I do believe you, that I need to do certain things. What I do may not make it happen, but doing something creates a process where something can happen. Where something can yeah, happen. Yeah, because I really don't know what made this church possible. I have lots of theory. I, you know, I. You know, we had meetings on Friday evenings. I called people, we sent out newsletters, let people know, do all these kind of things.
but I don't know what really, you know, real what really works. I think that's just little theories. Okay, so you would <laughs> say that you set up an opportunity right. for something to happen? And I think that's what I encourage people to do in their lives, and I do. You know, you put yourself in a place where you can feel something or experience something. You can go sit in a class and you create an opportunity of learning. Sometimes learning doesn't take place. Mm -hmm. You can go to a party and hope to have fun. Sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. But you can't have the experience of a party sitting in your room alone. Okay. So that the individual I mean, must take some action right. to get within yeah. the what the flow yeah, of or something possibility. Happened to you, something happened to you. Uh huh. You were talking about um, starting your own church and the kind of energy that that must have taken for you to. Had you started other projects in your life like this? Is this a style of yours to be a, a, a starter? Well, not like this. And I guess I'm going to just kind of play words a little bit, okay? Yes. Because yes. I don't really think I started my own church. Okay. Okay, I think I gathered, I had a concept about what a community could be like after years and years, thinking what would satisfy my soul. Okay. And I would like some intellectual stimulation. And I would like lots of music and aesthetic stimulation. And I wanted it to be a fairly um, sensitive, caring group of people that uh, were not into smiling all the time. Okay? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And that I gathered. I think I let people know about this concept. And then each person, and I have a feeling that the congregation has evolved where I just simply called people together and look after the Spirit is what I see my job as, as a minister. I think the church then, as each person comes into it, because of the kind of open-ended, it keeps evolving. And it does not look like what I thought my church would look like. That's only in my head. Does it have the qualities yeah. that satisfy right. yourself? Right, and that's what I keep watching. I enjoy being there. I love the people that are pulled or attracted to it. I like traveling with this group of people. It feels real, real nice. Because they are sensitive well, and intelligent? I don't know. Some like, I don't know. Uh, I think part of it is a recognizing not being at home in this world more than thinking about intelligence or sensitivity that, that the people drawn have something where they just don't fit into the world as it is and, and also some energy about making it a little different. Would it be a uh, congregation of individualists? Yeah, but that's not our religion. I mean, we're just kind of given that we were individuals and we couldn't help. I mean, it's kind of like you're born that way. Uh -huh. And it's not a religion. Oh, I'm going to do this because I want to be different. I mean, that's why I'm trying to say uh -huh. the lack of homeness in the world, the feeling that I just am not always clear about the way things are going on or you see stuff or experience stuff. Some people may be sensitive, some intelligent. Some may just be... Um, I don't even know what the word is, just aware that that they all they don't quite in the various subgroupings they've moved around and they always have a little different view. A little yeah. oddball? Yeah. Okay. And it might be as simple as believing when um, uh, back in the, the 40s or 50s when people would get upset and make a victim out of a young girl who got pregnant and they might it might be as simple as they felt well something's wrong with this uh-huh you know uh -huh. it doesn't have to be any huge things but just little things in the world uh -huh. you know or somebody tries to cheat someone out of a little money or something so i don't quite why is that going okay and that then they make choices right. take action and kind of start you know feeling and thinking for themselves and get aware of themselves what do you think um, causes in your group uh, the, uh, I say your group, I hear you say that this is not yeah, your group. It really isn't. 
then the existentialist uh, congregation, what would you say that it is a group of nonconformists? Yeah, the problem I'm having with these words is uh, they focus on people who often use these use such labels as kind of using that as a religion in and of itself. And I mostly want to say more about, well, the people are not, they are individuals, but all human beings are individuals. I mean, deep uh -huh. down inside, I believe each of them, I mean, our fingerprints, our voice patterns, we're so different, we are unique. Mm -hmm. And most people have some little area they do a little different. It may be real secretive. It may be a farmer who, you know, has a little thing that if he, when he turns the tractor around, if he whistles, it'll be a good crop. And nobody knows that. I mean, I think most human beings have these little areas that are non conforming So I wouldn't want to okay. stress it. I think probably the difference is, is we might be willing to let people know it and want to be in a place where we could kind of share some of our little idiosyncratic behaviors and also would like to feel all right. That you know, that is acceptable? That I'm okay, that, 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 that I'm all okay. right, that I'm all right. That's what communities are about. A places that validate what I already believe. Uh, that's why it's not just my shirt, it's people validating what they believe pretty much because a lot of people I don't believe like a lot of people in the church. Within a group? Validating. Yeah. How, did, how would that happen? Well, like you can say, I believe, um, if I, I was trying to think of a more specific kind of, I believe that my car will go 200,000 miles if I never drive it over 45 miles an hour. Okay. Okay. And I say, well, that's fine. I would not want to travel to Florida with you. <laughs> Okay. But rather than getting in the car with you and then trying to say, well, that's a crazy belief. How do you survive with that kind of crazy belief? I think that's the most bizarre thing you've ever, anybody's ever believed in. Don't you see it says the car's more efficient at 55? Here's the, here's the, the books on gasoline mileage. Mm -hmm. That's invalidating. Uh -huh. Okay. okay. Rather than saying, yeah, well, that's the way it is, and we will meet anywhere if we take a long trip. Okay. okay. Respecting differences yeah, right. then. Right. It's a big and that's part of the validation process and enjoying well this is the way and not feeling I've got to convince you that I see the world this way and bringing in all the loaded guns of science or whatever of the empirical studies to support yes, your position yeah, when basically I just want you to go faster uh -huh. for my convenience <laughs> that's what I call the thing okay uh huh when uh, one of the things you talked about is important to you is the aesthetics mm -hmm and uh, the spiritual aspects of it, the aesthetics. The existentialists have been, um, throughout history, associated with the arts. Mm -hmm. 